Uh, good morning, gentlemen. We're back for the second part of this interview. Uh, I have the privilege to uh, interview Calvin Ellerby, and we chatted a little bit in the first interview about the book. The book we're talking about is, uh, it's called It's Grandpa's Time. And I'll just show that to you folks, It's Grandpa's Time. And uh, there's the book. And uh, Cal, uh, we talked about uh, why you wrote the book in the last interview. Um, and the book came out in tw 2018. Uh, you, wrote, you wrote this book on the inspiration. God provided you with inspiration to write the book. Uh, and it's, it's been out now for a little more than two years. And my question, Cal, is what has the response been to this book? Well, marketing is not my strength. I, I give all my books away, and I have a colleague who said that my business model really is pathetic. So... <laughs> <laughs> But um, you know what, to be honest with you, I, I have not heard anybody who has looked at the principles and said, this is life to them. Um, I, I don't profess to be any scholar or, or magnificent author, but I believe the principles are a word from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so the, response to that has been incredible um it's you know the vision that the lord gave me was that we would see a million men who would commit to laying hands on their children and their grandchildren and impart blessing into their lives um just as a side note again the book was a step in the process of trying to communicate on a broader scale. We're actually in the middle of, not even in the middle, we're at the finish line of developing uh, two different apps that will be available for um, men to be able to get off of iTunes and whatever, Google, and, and um, that will help to develop these principles and some other things that um, don't need to go into, but Again, we're just trying to mobilize spiritual leaders, patriarchs, to engage in this principle. And uh, I, have a, I have a friend who is one of, he was the initial founder of the Samaritan's Purse movement in Canada. And I went to him and I said, how did you get this out he said, well, he said, I got a little chair and a little desk in my basement and I printed up flyers and I went and knocked on doors and told me all about how magnificent of how hard he worked. And then he stopped and he looked at me and said, we are dinosaurs. <laughs> if we don't figure out how to use social media, we're not going to get the job done. So that's kind of our focus right now. Yeah. Well, Cal, I just uh, I'm going to add to that. <clears throat> When I saw the book and when I read the book, uh, as a young man growing up raising children, having a young family, I thought to myself, wow, <laughs> everybody needs to be blessing their children. This is, this is got to be uh, raising family 101 from, uh, from a dad's point of view. So the book really had a huge impact on me and not so much for, for my family, but for other families, uh, especially young men uh, with uh, young families. Blessing is just absolutely. The pieces of our, of our app will be, it's called Airspace, H-E-I-R space. And it will be a, um, don't know how to describe it other than a, a journal where you'll have your family tree and a pictures and everything, be able to click on your family member and either type or speak into your phone blessings, then be able to archive those and make them available to your children going forward in the, the future. Um, very excited about it because I, I just see it as being a, 
excellent tool for, for passing blessing on. I agree. Now, <clears throat> this really ties into what's going on uh, with uh, Pastor Rick's uh, sermons that we've been listening to. And it's, uh, I don't believe in coincidences, but here in chapter six of your book, you discuss the importance of spiritual warfare. Your book states, as believers, we are involved in a spiritual battle with Satan and the kingdom of darkness, where he is determined to eradicate mankind. And I won't get into the details of eradicating mankind. There's been, uh, you know, Noah and Noah's Ark and many different stories where Satan has tried to uh, eradicate mankind. Satan hates humanity, hates the family. This is coming from the book and is scheming to destroy it. You also quote 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4, which states, as though we live in a world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. And I'm leading into this question because I think it's probably the most important element in the book, in my opinion, only. And that'll get you, that'll, that'll get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Dollars. <laughs> 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 yeah, exactly, that in ten dollars. Cal, could you expand uh, on the, the spiritual warfare that? Christian men need to be engaged in. Yes. So let me preface my statement by saying this, that more than being even engaged is just being aware. You know, Paul said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our fight is a spiritual fight. Therefore, if we're going to fight the fight, we need to fight it properly. And we need to understand that, that the tactics of the enemy are things like uh, division and fighting and arguing and disunity and, you know, chaos relationally. Um, then that stuff spills into some of the social craziness that we are witnessing because the breakdown, I forget who it was that said that in the United States, we don't have a crime issue. We have a fathering issue. Hmm. And that is a profound statement because when you take dad or grandpa out of the mix, or you make him a dysfunctional train wreck, it damages generations. You know, Moses said that, that um, the sins of the fathers would visit to the third and the fourth generation. And, and so many of us, you know, we, we fear that because we all have regrets and we all have, you know, we look at our behaviors and we go, oh man, that's gonna carry on. But the second half of that verse says is, but the blessing of God and the righteousness of God would visit a thousand generations. So my conviction is this, that when we're dealing with spiritual warfare, let's start with awareness ahead of everything else. This is a spiritual fight. And part of our alignment in in recognizing God's positional placement of us in the battle is a big part of the solution. You know, I don't, and it's, we're human. So we make mistakes and, and we do things that are dumb and whatever. But if I'm going to win this fight, I need to fight it God's way. And that means by starting and recognizing that he has created a structure so if you read in, uh, in, I think this is in the book, but in, well, I know it is, the uh, Ephesians 6 layout of the principalities and the powers and the spiritual 
uh, forces in dark places. There's a hierarchical role, like a military structure in those uh, titles. That same principle applies to us on, on the kingdom of light. God has created, you know, we know that the Archangel Michael is a high ranking, powerful entity. Mm-hmm. But God has chosen to include us in that hierarchy. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. He's chosen to include us in that hierarchy. That's why the spiritual fight to see us dismantled and dislodged is so ferocious. But if we're going to fight back, we need to fight it God's way. And that starts with an awareness in the spirit. Yeah. And I'll add to that. um, That's not our first go-to as men. I'll speak for myself here. We want to fix the problem. We want to uh, we want to get out the the hammer and the nails and, and get at it in uh, in the uh, physical realm. But where we need to start the spiritual realm, and I'm going to ask for your comments on this. I'm sure, I'm accurate from your perspective, but we start in the spiritual realm, and then in the physical realm. Things are going to work out a lot better than if we did it in reverse. We start in the physical realm and then we go to the spiritual realm going, oh, God, I need help because, oh, well, I made a real mess here. So I think the key takeaway is start in the spiritual realm. And it is powerful, very, very powerful. So if you could just maybe correct me on that, but that's what I think we're (laughs) we're headed. There's no correction. Okay. It, it is in alignment with what I said about it starts with awareness. Right. If, if I don't recognize and understand, I, I'm not a very touchy feely guy. So I, I'll <laughs> admit that up front. And the pressure on people to, to turn their walk with God into an emotional um whatever expression for me is not an accurate way for me to deal with this. I need to stop and look at the, the thing pragmatically and say, this is a positional thing. This, I need to be aware of the fact that God has put me in the fight in a spiritual role for a reason. Therefore, if I don't feel emotional, or if I do feel, either one is almost irrelevant. Because if I embrace the positional thing, and I'm aware of that, then when I pray, or then when I choose to walk with Jesus at a deeper level, I understand that I am opening up uh, pathways to the next generation that I may have impeded. And so I'm looking at, yes, I believe in, in, you know, dealing with spiritual forces. I believe in prayer. I believe in walking godly. But I'm not trying to psych myself up. That's not my point. Yeah. I'm aware spiritually that the position that God has put me in is integral to the blessing of God moving from generation to generation. Therefore, my spiritual fight takes on a different context. Yeah. In chapter seven of the book entitled, Embrace Your uh, Patriarchal Appointment, the book's study guide, and I got this from your study guide, indicates that the spiritual forces that we wrestle with have for decades been working through the channels of education, entertainment, politics, et cetera, to minimize and displace the influence and leadership of the patriarchs. It is Satan's plan to convince men that they are to be seen, not heard. This ongoing lie is a part of a diabolical scheme in a never-ending battle for the generations. Now, we've talked about this in part through this interview, but I just want to carry on here a little bit. We are witnessing the fruit of a culture and society that has been 
largely void of godly leadership. And your, uh, your study guide goes on to talk about that theme. So Cal, my question to you is, in that context, what are Christian men to do uh, as the family patriarch? Dealing with the context of the culture we're dealing with and um, what practical steps would you, would you encourage or, or recommend? Buy my book. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm just kidding. Yeah. Well. You'd know that my business model is pathetic. I, I, anyways, the um, what should they do in a practical sense? I, I would say they need to learn the five-step blueprint for starters. They need to understand the positional versus the behavioral significance of this calling. They need to understand what the blessing is. And, and I have gone through the Old Testament and the New Testament looking for some clues as to whether or not there's any consistent patterns when passing on the blessing. And I have summarized them into five categories yes. uh, that we would know God, that we would be full of his spirit, we would live under his favor, we would understand his purpose for our life, and he would understand that we would understand that we are the design of God, we are fearfully and wonderfully made with the breath of God having been put into us. So, so understand what the blessing is. And, and I know that I might be jumping ahead here, Kevin, but the third thing is that get with your grandchildren and your children and get your hands on them. Because there's something in the scriptures that is clear about the laying on of hands that there is impartation that is profound. And, and I often get asked, while I don't have the kind of relationship with my kids where they would let that happen. And I say, then get a picture on your phone and lay hands on your picture on your phone. Amen. And do a proxy. But get your hands on those kids and pass blessing on. The fourth thing is to speak life into their life. Words set the course for our lives. All of us, even as older guys, can look back at times, even as children, where somebody said something to us that impacted us or influenced us either positively or negatively. Depending on the role of that individual in our life, the more significance of that, you know, influence. Um, so speak life into them. Text them. Email them. Phone them talk in person, whatever it is, words are chosen by God as a vehicle for transformation. Use them. And the fourth or the fifth thing is that we do this in faith. And people, you know, have said, well, yeah, you know, you do everything in faith. This became so powerfully clear to me that faith is the thing that releases that blessing from one generation to the next. And I'll tell you why I think that. In Genesis 48, um, Jacob knew that he was on his deathbed. The Bible says he was on his deathbed. He rallied his strength, got up off the couch, laid his hands on those kids, then in chapter 49, he calls all 12 of his sons, other sons together, and he blesses each of them or speaks into their life directions that was going to set the course for their life. Then he died. You know, he didn't have the privilege of seeing the fruit of those things. And we know the you know, if you follow each person. We know that some went sideways and some were more significant or whatever it was. But my point is, is that if it wasn't done in faith, why would he do it? He's like, I'm just going to stay here on the couch and die. You know, I, 
I got no energy left, you know, what difference does it make? But there was something so profound and so powerful that it says he rallied his strength and got up off his couch and blessed his family. He knew that words mattered and that, and that the blessing was uh, very, very important. In your book, you talk about the blessing in step two. It says the purpose of the blessing is to transfer or impart the divine covering of God over the recipient and to set the course for their lives. And in step two, you, you break it out into these five other steps. You talk about the knowledge of God, the power of God, the favor of God, the purpose of God, the design of God. And, uh, you, you know, talk about that a little more as well. Um, so for the men, uh, listening, I encourage you buy the book. It gives you a great guideline and, uh, it's really encouraged me. It's changed, uh, Kathy and I, our devotions in the morning, in the morning when we have devotions, I don't say we have them every day, but we try to have them every day. Um, we, uh, I pray a blessing over Kathy and, uh, and Cal, I'll be, uh, <clears throat> A blessing my children now um, through the, through those pictures, and I hope that his uh, guideline helps uh, the men that are listening to this as well. Again, um, Evan, just to reaffirm, this is a positional, not a behavioral. Yes, should be. it's it's positional, not behavioral, and uh, it's what's going on that we can't see. Yeah, exactly, it's and uh, the future. Thank you for that and uh, for the men to listen to that message as well because it speaks to me in a big way. Um, just as an aside, Cal, Pastor Rick is going to be interested to hear this. I'm not a touchy-feely guy either. Just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so and, I uh, am. So, <laughs> so one out of three ain't bad. Yeah, so we... Uh, we are the majority here, and uh, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. But what I'd like to do <clears throat> is uh, close in prayer. Um, and my prayer is a prayer that I've been praying uh, for the men and for myself. It's Psalm 91. And I believe it's very apropos for the times we are living in today. So I'm going to pray this prayer, literally read the prayer from Psalm 91, if that's okay with everybody. Yeah. And we'll close. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for the opportunity to have an interview with Cal. And I uh, pray that the book goes well and the message uh, go well and that Cal's uh, endeavors for this book uh, bless them, Lord, and, 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 and prosper them so that they can get out. It's a very important message for our men. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I trust. Surely he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. And from the perilous pestilence, he shall cover you with his feathers. And under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Lord God, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for Psalm 91. You're covering us. You're covering us during these very, very difficult times, covering each man and their families Lord, that are listening to this podcast. Again, Lord, I pray blessings on the men that are listening to the podcast, and I thank you, Lord, for Cal and for Pastor Rick for putting this together. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I would like to say one thing. In closing, God never designed us to walk alone. I, I would encourage your 
patriarchs and your men to partner up with other guys of like faith and like heart and um, hold one another accountable, encourage one another, mobilize and motivate one another. Um, because Nehemiah said, trust in the Lord or remember the Lord. Uh, don't be afraid and fight for your families. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I agree. We yeah. need to do it together. Yeah. Thank you guys for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. Yeah. Bye. Thank you for your time.